Um, thank you all for joining us today. Um, we're going to get started with the Building Resilient Communities Online and In-Person presentation from our guest panelists. A few technical um, things before we get started. For those of you just joining us, the easiest way to access the control panel and the options in Zoom is to exit the full screen mode. You can do that at the top of your window. Just click on the drop view options, drop down menu and select exit full screen mode. To chat, please click on the chat icon. The default in Zoom is that the chat will go to the panelists to share your questions and comments with your fellow attendees. Please select all panelists and attendees from the drop down menu. <coughs> we are providing close, <coughs> excuse me. I am not sick. I have a chronic cough and allergies. I apologize. Um, to access the closed captioning, please click on the closed caption icon for the, uh, let's see. For technical support, if you need technical support during the webinar, please use the Q&A function in Zoom and myself or my colleague who's here providing assistance will help you. Uh, if you're having trouble hearing us, you may need to adjust your output for your computer or raise your volume. That should not be in this PowerPoint. Uh, so I want to go ahead and welcome everyone to today's Kernel of Knowledge webinar series. This is provided to you through the National Network of Libraries of Medicine, Greater Midwest Regional Office, hence the Kernel and our Kernel of Knowledge. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, we're located at the University of Iowa. We have an exciting presentation for today, so I want to go ahead and get started to make sure that we have um, time for all the questions and comments. Just a reminder that you are automatically muted upon entry and this webinar is being recorded. In order to uh, ask questions or make comments, please use the chat function in the, in, the, in the Zoom menu. This webinar will be posted to the Library of Medicine, National Network of Libraries of Medicine YouTube ch channel for future viewing. That recording usually is up in about a week. Everyone who registered for the webinar will receive a link to the recording once it is posted. This webinar provides one and a half continuing education credits from the Medical Library Association. I will include the link for claiming that credit in the recording email, so look for that with that. I also want to quickly introduce myself. I'm the host today. My name is Bobby Newman, and I am the Community Engagement and Outreach Specialist at the Greater Midwest Region, and I connect with the public libraries in our 10 state region and across the nation. Also, I would like to remind, <laughs> point out that myself, like many of you, are working from home right now. Uh, I do have a small dog that tends to be well-behaved, but may bark <laughs> during this time. Um, please be forgiving for myself and panelists if you see children, partners, people, pets um, appear on camera. So, oh, and a quick word about who we are. If you're not familiar with the National Network of Libraries of Medicine, um, we are part of the National Institutes of Health, which is the nation's leading research agency. Right now, you might be more familiar with the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, where Dr. Fauci is. Um, it's one of the many institutes and centers at NIH. The National Library of Medicine is also an institute at NIH, and it is the world's largest biomedical library, which maintains and makes available a vast print collection and produces electronic information resources such as Medline Plus or PubMed. The National Network of Libraries of Medicine is an outreach program of the NNLM, and there are eight regional offices that make up um, that network, and I am from the greater Midwest region. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce today's panelists. Billy Joe is a director of Studio 270. Is it 270? Mm -hmm. I say it. Information Services. Glenna is the um, engagement liaison for community services and program development. Angela is the South Elgin Branch Manager, Neighborhood Services, and we have Danielle, who's the Community Collaboration Coordinator, Community Services and Program Development. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen and let Billy take over. Okay. Well, I just want um, my team to wave. Uh, we're gonna close out so that we're not distracting you with our movements um, and We'll see them in a little bit. Thank you very much. 
Gail Borden is uh, fueled by the power. Well, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to Bobby and the National Network of Libraries of Medicine, uh, GMR. We are glad to be back. We thank you so much for the opportunities to share, and we thank you uh, so much for all of the professional development that you do uh, with us and for us. Um, it's a wonderful resource, and, and we appreciate you very much. Uh, welcome, everybody. You made it. It's Friday. Uh, yes, you're in another Zoom webinar or meeting, and um, thank you for that. Uh, thank you for joining us. And this is an important topic, so uh, we have a lot to share. I want to get through a little bit of an introduction about us and uh, turn it over to um, Billy to dive in a little bit deeper. The Gail Borden Library District in Illinois straddles two counties. We serve two municipalities and we stretch into four other bordering towns. We reach approximately 150 area residents. Uh, we have a, about a million visitors a year and um, we have the three locations, our bookmobile, a book bike, and a readership actually. Uh, Madeline from Hispanic Services goes out and serves our community with story times uh, all over town. So museums and, and uh, places like that, events, large events. She does farmer's market uh, with me sometimes, which is fun. Um, our district serves a vibrant and culturally diverse citizenry engaged in various forms of volunteerism lifelong learning and community involvement. And we are, of course, like you, powered by community. Uh, next slide, please, Billy. You may or may not be hearing um, my uh, partner here in quarantine, Eric, who works for the Oak Park Public Library. We're both working from home. So if you hear any uh, background noise, I apologize for that, but we're both hard at work for our communities. Um, this slide is talking about community resiliency. Uh, our presence at community tables has connected us to organizations and individuals who have become partners or volunteers. We leverage their expertise and resources with our own. Our ability to train community and be trained by other trusted organizations has built our community resiliency overall, which has really shown uh, most evidently during the COVID-19 trauma, collective trauma that we're all experiencing. I hope you realize uh, that we're all um, in the same storm, different boats, right? Different capabilities uh, within our libraries, our communities, and personally. So, um, you know, we also wanna make sure we're honoring that. Uh, cultivate community relationships across sectors, share organizational training and wisdom, and then the organizational wisdom that we gain becomes uh, the collective wisdom for the community. So um, that's kind of, an, I think, an important point for us uh, to remember that it's not just about uh, specific trainings or um, specific methodologies. It's more about gaining a collective wisdom, which libraries are um, already hard at work uh, doing. So thank you. Next slide, please, Billy. There are uh, endless community building tools to use, uh, asset-based community development, ABCD, to uh, the Harwood Institute. Many of you have used uh, different, different models for community development and building. Um, we've benefited from many of these methods, uh, but today we're gonna focus on uh, ABCD for this particular purpose. We identify uh, assets in our community. We determine missions and visions of these organizations uh, and where resiliency building works, work aligns. That includes uh, literacy, lifelong learning, community health and safety. So if a community feels secure, uh, they're more able to explore their learning. Um, sometimes we have questions or uh, situations where people say, well, but that's not a library. Uh, mission or vision and really if you look at the community holistically it makes sense for us to be at these tables um, because a safe and secure community can learn and explore and read and grow so um, this slides talking a little bit about city to county uh, preschool to higher education local health coalitions to hospitals and health departments 
senior service groups to nursing home facilities, restorative justice groups to law enforcement, your sheriff's departments, your juvenile justice councils, gardens groups to forest preserves or recreational centers, just mapping uh, what your community has to offer. And if you're a small community, look at your county. What does your county uh, have to offer? Um, we often look at what other communities are doing outside the Chicago area, within Chicago, um, and across the uh, nation. So um, that's one thing that libraries do well is to um, is to share and grow and learn. Uh, it's part of the wonderful thing about our profession is we can learn from each other and we've learned a lot from other libraries and, and actually other organizations that we work with and um, that we've had training from. Next uh, slide, please, Billy. So what do resilient communities offer? Um, ACE is trained, and Billy's going to get into that, trauma-informed, uh, school district U46, which is the second largest school district outside of Chicago, with a fully connected alignment collaborative for education, which is a you know, community resource um, organization, leverages all sectors of the community resources for early education through high school, and has brought us uh, multiple opportunities for staff and community training. Um, Dementia-friendly communities, uh, resilient communities, uh, city and village leaders, health departments, senior groups, developmental groups, assisted living facilities. Um, they're all our natural partners for that purpose. And peace prevention and focus. So, um, Elgin is a, uh, the City of Elgin, the Human Relations Commission, educational institutions. Um, that's, you know, that's something that, that we look for uh, to partner with for peace and prevention tools for our community. And you see Madeline uh, above is reading a story. She's, um, bi she's reading bilingual stories at uh, iFest for our International City of Peace tent that Gail Borden uh, sponsors. And then uh, below is uh, Tish Calmer, uh, Billy, and I uh, for the um, Trauma Informed Care uh, Day Awareness Day, which is coming up. Billy will probably talk a little bit about that. Next slide, please. So we're aware of our resources. We host resources like the Literacy Connection, uh, Office Hours for King County Law Library, Family Services Association, Social Service has caseworkers uh, at the library. We have career and resume help, uh, Information Services runs that. Uh, we have staff and board members or volunteers involved and engaged at all community tables. Restorative. Um, we work with the King County Juvenile Justice Council, Elgin Community College, Multicultural and Global Initiatives Committee for Restorative Practice, um, Safety, Justice, Equity Programming, uh, Awareness Programming, Cultural Competencies, and um, Health and Safety. So our district regularly works with the Sheriff's Department, Police Departments, King County Health Department. Uh, we spearhead some, a subcommittee for Activate Elgin, which is a local wellness coalition uh, for information about health programming, series programs. Um, we host programs by hospitals and fitness organizations that we have gained through uh, time. So you'll see this uh, at the top is Professor Joyce Fountain from Elgin Community College. She's a sociology professor, and she ran our Race the Power of an Illusion series uh, that is part of the um, ECC Magic group that we uh, help with planning. So we do programming at the college. They do programming with us at the library. Um, and then below is uh, Ryan Dowd, who Angela will talk about later. Of course, many of you know about homelessness and the library and his work at Hassett House in Aurora. 
um, who uh, I think he's been doing some live uh, podcasting, so that's fun. And then we have uh, Sarah Sabo, who is one of our two offer operating officers, and our chief uh, Lally, and then regional education um, people and our PADS, so Public uh, Action to Deliver Shelter is is featured there. And we're, we're watching the public at the Ultra Screen and Marcus Theater. Uh, so we had the, the film and, and a panel discussion with um, actual people who, uh, Doug, who um, is Housing Secure, who was able to attend and, and talk with us too about um, his experiences being, uh, he says, houseless. So we're going to say houseless. Um, let's see, where am I? So the library has spearheaded efforts or supportive partners to designate Elgin as a dementia-friendly community, international city of peace, trauma-informed community, and autism aware. Next slide, please. Thank you, Billy. So these connections and collective wisdom sharing informs our work, brings us a rich pool of professional presenters, volunteers, and services which are priceless, quote unquote. Uh, we cultivate resiliency partners, free staff training, thousands of dollars in staff training available each year from our partners, resources for programs, so monetary grant, grant partnerships and in-kind donations, um, expert presenters, uh, sponsors, or in-kind, as we saw Joyce was um, helping with a program, engaged talented volunteers, so our volunteers have served, uh, I believe we just had volunteer week and uh, celebration virtually, uh, unfortunately. And um, our volunteers, the numbers came in at over 10,000 hours last year. So uh, we match volunteers with um, their passion uh, and, and our work. So if you're able to use volunteers, uh, there's some ideas for you to do that value return back to the community i believe is uh, millions of dollars and we we actually have uh, reports every year that we calculate the return on investment through volunteer hours through grants through um, uh, attendance and uh, presenters and sponsorship dollars for for programming and uh, content so we strive to serve all of our community, every age, every engagement level and interest. Um, and I think that uh, is all I have for you now. So we'll talk a little bit about ABCD later and I'll wrap up some of the things um, that you might have questions about uh, after the rest of the presenters present. I thank you very much. And I'm gonna turn this over to my partner, um, on many projects, Billy Moffitt, uh, and I'll be back at the end before our Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. I'm, as Danielle said, I'm Billy Moffitt, and I'm the director of Studio 270. Studio 270 is our high school teen center and digital media lab. We serve high school students on the second floor of the main library, and don't worry, there is a middle school librarian and a space just for them on the first floor inside of our kids' space department as well. We were experiencing a loss of teenagers after about the age of 14, so we decided to create a space just for high school students so that we wouldn't lose them at 14 and then we wouldn't see them again until they had kids of their own. So we are trying to uh, turn high school students into lifelong library users so they have a good experience at the library during their formative teen years and can help them transition to adult services. We do a lot of different things for teens, a safe space for them to go. We open at three o'clock on school days and stay open until the library closes. And then on weekends, no school days, and throughout the summer, we open at noon. We experimented with opening at nine when we first started the studio 10 years ago, but teens are sleeping. So we open at noon because there's no use to. But if I'm in there and a teen comes, I'll open for them early. 
we do technology programs, we do open mic nights, crafting events, we record movies and music in our digital media lab, and we're really proud of the young people who have gone through our digital media lab to come and make music and other creative endeavors. Many of our young people have created songs that got played on Chicago radio stations. So we're very proud of those teens, as well as a group, the Future Kings, who you might have seen on America's Got Talent and as a background dancers during a Saturday Night Live event um, this December. So we're really proud of them and they still come and record in Studio 270 to this day. The group, the picture of the young men on the right, they've actually decided to come to the library to help to plan a music event that they were planning themselves. For them, so for them to think of the library as a place to come and plan and get the resources they need for them to be successful is a huge win for us. We partner with many organizations, and as Danielle has talked before, one of our largest partners is our school district, U46. As Danielle has said, they're the second largest school district in the state of Illinois, serving 38,000 students. And a group that is in partnership with UD46 is the Alignment Collaborative for Education. Alignment partners U46 with community members so that, sorry, my husband's walking off the stairs, I lost my train of thought. They partner with the, the, bringing the school district and the community together to make strong schools and strong communities. The priorities of alignment are early education so that elementary school students have success trauma-informed care and community, and pathways for all high school students so they can be academic and career ready by the time they leave high school. We have library members on the leadership board as well as on every of the priority A teams early education, trauma-informed care, and pathways. So the library is very involved in this um, belief that we can make our community stronger by making our school district stronger. Danielle and I are on the Trauma-Informed Care A team. This is a team of school district members, including social workers and people in the administration, members of the healthcare community from our local hospitals and our local mental health care community, including therapists. We have the health, the county health department is on there, as well as many non-for-profits, the workforce development, um, and other organizations. We're coming together to raise awareness of adverse childhood experiences, or something we call ACEs, growing expertise in trauma-informed care, and addressing compassion fatigue amongst teachers and other people who uh, experience compassion fatigue in the community for serving the public. So trauma-informed care, if you're not aware, is the understanding that in your day-to-day -day life, people you come in contact with have most likely experienced trauma sometime within their life, something that happened in their childhood or something that happened this morning. So if we approach working with our public with the idea of trauma-informed care, we can create a better environment for everybody. In Studio 270, we understand that a lot of our teens are experiencing a lot of trauma. They were yelled all day at school. They went home and they were yelled at all day. They come to the library and I don't want them to be kicked out because they need the library. So instead of kicking them out for a small infraction, like swearing is probably the biggest infraction that we have to talk to teens about, as well as keeping their area not trashed, um, is working with them to understand that we are a partner in their life and that we want them 
to be there, be happy. We don't want to make them adversarial with us. We want them to make a partner with us. So talking and understanding that they might have trauma in their life has made it easier with us turning teens from adversarial teens that are swearing just to swear to becoming partners with us and getting other teens not to swear in the studio as well. A small, but a big help. We also address compassion fatigue. Danielle works very closely with our, the wellness committee um, within the U46 school district, providing training as well as I've provided book lists and other resources that the library and the community can access. We provide training that we've also provided for library staff and for the public at large. When you're working with the public, as most librarians do, we experience a lot of compassion fatigue, something that I had to work with when I started to work with teens 10 years ago. At the start, many times I had to go into my car and cry because I had to teach a teen how to change a diaper and they didn't know how to change their own baby's diaper and they were only 15 or the time that a young man who grew up with us in the studio became an adult and came back to me because he had no place for his uh, girlfriend and baby to go for the night during a cold winter night. I helped get him a place to stay and we talked through it and I always worry about this young man, but I have worked with, um, wellness in mind and my compassion fatigue so I'm not taking that home day to day and it affecting my everyday life. So we also work with that. But the biggest thing that I'm involved in is adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. Adverse childhood experiences were first brought up as a national epidemic in the 1990s with a study that was done with 17,000 people with Dr. Rob Anda, Dr. Vincent Folletti, the CDC, and Kaiser Permanente. They studied, a, they, they studied all of these people and not only what has happened, but what has happened throughout their whole life. Not only their adverse childhood experiences, but how it affects their mental health, their social health, and their physical health. And ACEs, or childhood experiences, was rated on a test of one to 10, with one being a low score and 10 being the highest. And you can score a zero as well. Things that were on the test are did a parent or adult in the household often swear at you, insult you, put you down or humiliate you, act in a way that made you feel afraid or might be physical hurts? Did you often or very often feel that your family, no one in your family loved you or thought you were important or special? There are 10 questions that go on and on about being uh, experiencing abuse, being abused yourself, seeing your mother being abused, being in a household that you felt. It can be in a score of one to 10. And one of the example slides I put on the lower left are kids living in a fight or flight area. If they only experience danger and they are always fighting and fighting or freezing. So they're experiencing trauma in their school, trauma at their home, trauma at the library. That means they'll most likely grow up to be an adult that thrives in the worst case situations. So create situations for themselves where they're always living in chaos. We wanna stop ACEs because it can lead to early death. People with higher ACE scores tend to live 20 years um, less than their cohorts. They can have more disease, more obesity, more smoking, more alcoholism, and on and on and on. Now there isn't a pathway to stop ACEs at this time, but that doesn't mean that we as communities can ignore what people are experiencing and having higher ACE scores. 
we can make sure that our users have positive views of themselves and self-efficacy. We can help them have little successes that make them believe in themselves. We can create relationships with caring and competent people. If they don't feel that at home, they can find it at school or the library or the Boys and Girls Club. We can also create a strong community that supports everybody's culture and individuality. And we can help everybody be a leader. Through alignment and U46, I received training from ACE Interfaces along with two other librarians from Gail Borden. We have been training not only the school district, but also the community as well. A picture of me here presenting at a countywide Teacher Institute Day for about 200 teachers throughout the county. We've also trained at um, we also trained at a school institute day for U46. We trained the public services librarians at Gail Borden and online in two weeks we'll be training uh, early childhood workers, work, people who work in daycare and for preschools. So it's important that we have received this training but we're also being able to give it out to our community and our organization. Danielle and I are also members of the King County Juvenile Justice Council Subcommittee on Restorative Practices. Through there, we've been working with all of the school districts in the county to make sure that restorative practices are being used and that training is being made available countywide. We are working with restorative practices so that everybody can stay in school because we want to stop the pipeline from school to the, ju to, the just, um, to the justice system. We don't want young people to fall into a pattern where it ends up that they're incarcerated. So restorative practices helps everybody have a voice in the system, be heard, be understood, and that everybody can find a way to be together and to get along. And through there, we've provided training and the libraries provided resource lists and has helped out at the training events. One of my biggest partners is the Elgin Police Department. We do a monthly series called Elgin Teen Life, where we partner the police with teens in the community to do a fun event. Now, the police were wanting to connect with teens on a wider level and were having issues outside of sporting events. They knew how to do a pickup basketball game but didn't know how to connect with teens that didn't want to do physical activities. So we've been coming up with ideas and getting them to do things with us like um, teaching teens auto maintenance. And the upper right is knitting for a cause where we're knitting hats and scarves that were given to the crisis center. We do cupcake and cookie decoration. And self-defense is probably the easiest thing that you can start. If you want to partner with your police department, have them do a self-defense workshop for teens. The teens love it. The police love it. It's real fun. They get to kick and throw around the cops with mats and learn how to break holds. It's super fun. We've also partnered with our resident officer, Heather Farrell, at her house for National Night Out, where we brought our whole open mic night, a DJ, performers, and we performed in front of her house for the whole community. But you can partner with anybody in the community. Abby wanted to do a Girl Up Club. She was involved with this UN organization and wanted to start one at the library. Now where I can't officially partner with her because most of their activities are fundraising for other organizations, I provide her space and I also provide her contacts within the community. Here she's giving a presentation for women's issues that we also got a local congresswoman to come out and present with her as well. We present with the local YWCA with their digital club where they come out to the digital media lab to use some of our higher end resources. Have special ed classes come. 
we also partnered with the private school, Elgin Academy, that's down the street from us to do college events. Here in the lower left, you can see we had quite a successful event. 20 people came out to a college program, which is really good for us. But just this past Tuesday, we, we put our spring one online and did it through Zoom and actually had 48 people come and log on, which was a great program for teens in college. So they were, we were talking about the admissions process. But also think about partnership within your organization. In the lower middle, we see playing Jenga, Aaron from Information Services. And we partnered to bring a, a board game event for teens and young adults who have in special ed. And standing up looking over the Jenga event is my mom because I roped her in because she works with adults with developmental disabilities. So I had her come and volunteer during the event as well. Where in your community can you partner? It's not only will they say yes, sometimes it's a matter of just introducing yourself and keeping in contact. Our local LGBTQ group for teens, Youth Outlook, that meets at the YWCA, I introduced myself and stayed in contact with them for eight months before they agreed to come to the library and do something. So you never know what you're gonna do. Sometimes you just have to reach out and say hello or ask somebody in your organization to connect you with somebody. Partnerships make a strong, resilient community. And now I'm gonna pass it over to Glenna. Well, hello. Thanks again for joining us today. I'm Glenna Kodinsky. I know that Billy just shared a lot of great information already, and I thought I'd just reiterate what she just said there. Um, everything that we're describing, it all happened one step at a time over time. And I'm not that patient of a person, so sometimes I'm looking ahead to, you know, my goals, and I know I have to kind of back it down. It'll eventually happen, as Danielle says, in the right time. So if we can help you see new possibilities within your work environment, as well as discovering ways to make things workable with your schedule and your resources, that would be our goal today. So please do reach out to us if you'd like to brainstorm about your specific situations. It'll be great. I, so, I love that we get to do this exchange. We'll be so happy to hear all of your questions and ideas. If we can pop to the next slide. At Gail Gordon Public Library District, uh, my role is Life Enrichment Liaison. My job description says that I'm to go out into the community and serve people where they are. The number of people who cannot come into libraries, even during the non-COVID times, has been growing as our population ages. For physical, social, emotional, or economic reasons, that can be, you know, the hardships that people face. My first task was figuring out where is this audience? So I have a checklist for you. We will make these slides available if you let us know that you're interested because I'm gonna fly through these. You probably won't have time to write them down, but I'm hoping that you might see yourself in some of these examples. Are you currently serving some of the following audiences in your library district? Uh, does your district have senior care communities such as independent living, assisted living, skilled care such as nursing homes or rehab centers? What about memory care, developmental communities such as group homes? Is there a day care for adults? Uh, can you reach out to home caregivers through, who are going you know, through their houses of worship or community recreation centers? What about your area agencies on aging? Can you reach out with them and also your senior services association? And also how about service, social service organizations like the Kiwanis, the Rotary, and then another great connection is your local police senior liaison. Those are all great places to start and to build connections with your library. So I've been asked when I've presented before, do activity directors at the care communities feel like you're coming in and stepping on their toes, bringing in programs? And I thought it was a great question. But the truth of the matter is they're on day in and day out. They have to be keeping everybody busy all the time with something. And it's been a relief to them to be able to work with the local library. 
It wasn't something that they just organically thought of. I needed to go knock on doors and introduce myself. Um, but when I did, I would come in and I would just kind of ask if they already had a project that I could partner on. And it was just a way of meeting them where they are, as we say. Um, I always strive to ease the staff's workload. That's my goal. Um, so this is the way that we can kind of come in and introduce ourselves to different portions in the community. Um, and eventually then we do get asked to become members of boards across the community. I saw that question pop up in the chat. Um, so it's by supporting their residents in the care communities, we're also supporting our library patrons. So that was kind of a checklist. And in current times, is your staff able to do something? You know, we're all, we're all in a whole different world now. <laughs> so are you able to do something like print a card of encouragement for one of those organizations on the checklist? On the next screen here, we can pop ahead, Billy. Um, this is gonna be a photo of the card layout that our library team distributed last week. We were going in and serving 400 senior and developmental residents each month inside their communities with in-person library programming. So we knew we needed to do something to let them know that we really missed them. So we printed these and got them out to the residents. Because we already had library programs developed that had been um, being presented at the senior living and developmental communities, I'm now taking those programs that I put together in little kits and I'm turning those into videos, working from my little home video studio with my dog and cat <laughs> here at El Elgin, Illinois. Um, now, could your team make a simple video showcasing the pets of your library employees? That was something that we did. We used our phones to tell short stories about our pets and show them off. And the whole point of that is just, we all love animals. And so it's a way to connect with people on a basic level all across your community. They, let, they see you as very human, not that you know, scary librarian from the past shushing everyone. Um, our home services coordinator, Sarah, used free video editing apps that, on her, her iPad, and she was able to link the video segments together that we all sent her from our homes. And then that went out to our community partners. Links to this video and one that I did from a previous program called Great American Amusement Parks are going to be available in the notes to this webinar. So please feel free to share those in your community as well. That would just be an honor to us. Um, the research in the videos is vetted. The videos are, the content is free use, copyright, and royalty free. And so I'm currently in the process of converting 36 programs into that type of video format. Activity directors, the way they do it is they'll download the videos onto laptops. They place the laptops onto rolling carts and those rolling carts sit in the doorways to residents' rooms within the care communities because a lot of them are quarantined to their rooms. So the residents will come to the doorways to watch. And that way there's no cross-contamination with the sharing of devices. And videos can also be played on a large screen inside a care community where they're, they have a big enough space and they're able to have small groups gather socially distanced. If we can go to the next slide, please. So a question is, where can you find volunteers? And the answer is right within that checklist that we just went over. For this library display wall, we had our memory care residents cut out the leaves, all the green leaves on there. The memory cafe participants wrote acrostic poems for the tree trunks. And they did that during a session where we had a local poet come and inspire them with her poetry and then they sat and wrote poetry, which then went up on the wall here. And then when the display went up, library visitors were able to come in, create their poems, write them on the leaves, and add it into this beautiful community art piece. It was really quite a cool thing. I have residents in two memory care communities who cut out all the craft materials that I need for in-person programming each month. And uh, that's been just amazing. They feel busy. They know that they're doing something to help somebody out and it just really boosts their morale. They put some music on, sit together at a table with their activity director, and I don't give them a set time frame. I produce, have them produce things for months ahead of time. That way, whenever it suits, they can work on it. There's no pressure. Um, they've also made cat toys with me that I've dropped off at the local animal shelter. Memory care residents also sit and shred newspaper as kind of a transitional activity that gets used for animal bedding at the shelter. And our developmental group creates posters 
for our monthly program that serves those 400 seniors. And I think we have a picture of that. Let's see what the next slide is. <laughs> There it is, okay. So um, what we did was Association for Individual Development made a poster that I used at each program that I gave on the caste system that existed on circus trains in the 1800s. How's that for outside the box? Um, we took Ellison die cuts from the library out to the group and they decided how they would do the layout. They each took a different car that they wanted to make and they put that all together for me. And then we went around and described how the cast system worked. Just as a little aside, you see the pie car there? If you were sitting in front of the pie car, you were high status and you had to eat inside. But if you were on the other end of the train, you got your meals and you had to go sit under a tree somewhere. Just some fun information. That's completely useless. Um, okay, slide number six. Can we pop on to the next one? Um, let's see here. Library volunteers are currently writing letters of encouragement to seniors. One volunteer that we have just absolutely loves to crochet. She's incredibly talented. And so she included the little hearts and stars inside the cards that you see in that middle slide. So even though we're not going in in person and doing our programming right now, we're still staying connected and our volunteers are still staying busy. If we can pop to the next slide. So I couldn't reach the audience that I do without the help of these volunteers because I'm a department of one. I hope that you might be able to see yourself in some of the scenarios listed below. Um, first, I'll say though, the most important thing about volunteers, I believe, is to remember that they don't serve your organization. Instead, your library is still serving them. And that's how retention works, because you're creating an opportunity that serves a purpose in their lives. When they feel that sense of belonging, that's how you secure retention. In the left-hand photo above, one of my volunteer teams is presenting a monthly program that they help me research and put together. It's called Library Fun and Facts. And each month we have a different topic. We share facts, folklore, poetry, music, and we make a community art piece. So we spend the last portion of the program one-on-one -on -one working with the residents on that craft. In the photo, you can see that we've got a, a college student, and she's there building her resume by giving programs at assisted living centers. Then there's a wife whose husband is still working while she is retired, and so she needs something meaningful to do, so she comes out and does incredible programming for, for us. There's also an avid reader slash researcher who is retired, but needs to still share her talents with the community. And then there's a young mom who was looking for some interaction with adults while her son is off at school. So those are all different types of people that can become incredible volunteers for you. In the top right-hand corner, you see more of our volunteers. And then in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see volunteers at a holiday party at one of our developmental communities. The programming that we do includes the volunteer projects that they create for other community organizations. So every time we get together, we're turning them not into end users, but into community volunteers, because what they produce then goes on to another part of the community. So today I have a team of 10 research and design volunteers who design and implement library programming at 24 care communities each month. This didn't start this way. This started with as I said, a department of one. <laughs> so it can be done within your community as well. Um, we now serve around 400 people with in-person programs and library materials delivery. So where do you find these volunteers? Well, if you already have people who come into the library to help you with shelving books, find out what their artistic interests are. Would they help you lead a greeting card program? You know, we everyone got started one step at a time. Um, would they drop the cards that they create with a group at a local senior center after the little event, if you made the arrangements? Um, speak with faith leaders in your community to ask if you can put uh, requests out in their communications to their congregations. Put signs up inside your library asking people to join your new volunteer team. Recruit students from local colleges and talk with neighborhood associations. You can contact your school district to connect with retirees. And I recruit students from the local community college 
um, just to do one-time fidget square building. So that doesn't mean the kids have to come and commit their lives to being a volunteer. They can just spend one afternoon building little fidget squares, which we made out of baggies, and we put little uh, manipulatives inside along with some of the hand gel, and then taped it with duct tape around the edges. And that's for someone who has dementia. They have very um, squirmy fingers and that kind of thing. So this is something that's a very relaxing activity. And it's also good for those people that have arthritis to keep their, their hands moving. So this is something the kids can do in a one-time shot, and you can then deliver to a nearby care community. So I have many jobs that don't require perfection, they just require heart. And if we can flip to the next slide. What about the front of your information desk? Could it use some decorating? What about the teachers in your community? Could they use some help maybe for their bulletin boards? Our memory care community recently made butterfly pencil holders for local kindergarten teachers to give to their students. Not everyone will be capable of volunteering, of course, but imagine the joy and purpose that your library can bring back into the lives of those who are able. And think of the time saved and the support felt by those who received the help. So as you can see, it's a very simple, low cost craft, but these little butterflies went a long way in building rapport among community entities. Then if we go to the next slide, this one is gonna demonstrate how one program collaboration led to another within our personal experience in our library district. Um, there were a number of community partners that just kept coming on board and the momentum kept building. I won't spend much time on this. You can always study it later if you're interested, but um, it began with programs. We can pop to the next slide that my 10 volunteers and I designed. Our programs are called Cruise in the Country and Library Fun and Facts. And you can see we're working with a group of seniors here. A little note that's super, super important that I always love to include is when people have dementia, they are usually able to read all the way through to the last stages. And that's very, very empowering for them. So sometimes I'll take in books and ask someone uh, to read something in front of a new activity director. And the activity director is thinking, oh, they can't really read, they don't read, they don't talk. And all of a sudden, surprise, <laughs> which is wonderful because then they're seen in a new light by the staff when you can give them that opportunity of empowerment. If we can pop to the next slide. So there was some training that got us to this point. Uh, there are three of us in the library that are certified dementia practitioners through the National Council of Certified Practitioners. It took us an eight hour day of coursework, um, which cost $250 a person. The $30 was to file the paperwork for all three of us, and then we each bought our $12 lapel pin. Every two years, we pay $35 for uh, re-upping our certification, and we're listed then on their website as someone who has completed that course. Also, I went through the Azura Virtual Dementia Tour, and I can't stress enough, if you get a chance to go through a Virtual Dementia Tour, take it. Um, it's amazing. I actually was a caregiver for my mom, and she had Lewy body dementia, lived with us for her last four years. So there are things that are just indescribable that happen with that disease. So people who are caregivers kind of have a language of our own. People really understand, and that's where you can get a lot of support if you're working in a dementia-friendly community. People who understand want to come forward and help. So uh, that's just some, some things that you can do in order to have those experiences and understand. Um, then let's flip to the next screen. Here we have our Elgin Memory Cafe, and we've got a picture of, I had to have that gigantic scissors. That's our mayor in the blue shirt there. And I was like, we've got to have the gigantic scissors for the ribbon cutting, so we got those. And um, we, with our Elgin Memory Cafe, average 15 visitors per month. Uh, we maintain a list of people that uh, are recurring attendees, but anyone who's ever attended goes onto our email list and they remain a part of our group until they ask not to be. And we have people who have lost their partners who remain and still, still attend. Um, and it's been just a fantastic way of reaching people who are in their homes they may not feel comfortable coming into the library with their loved one because their loved one may have outbursts. They may behave in ways that are not, quote, socially acceptable. And so they don't want to bother anyone. 
this is a great way out in the community to reach those folks. So this memory cafe meets at a local IHOP restaurant and we do all sorts of things. We always have a discussion topic, which is based often on the library type programs that we, we do. Um, and then it's very open, free form, very laid back, very comfortable, very low key uh, for people to come. If they want to order off the menu, they can, but we keep it completely free. So the restaurant agrees that there is no pressure to order off the menu. Uh, so we're open to all. We're also on a bus route and we are off of any kind of main highways. So it makes it comfortable for people to drive and come there. When we had success with our Elgin Memory Cafe, we also have a large Hispanic community in Elgin and we wanted to open Cafe de los Recuerdos so that we could reach some of the families that are caring for loved ones in their community. So Cafe of the Memories, uh, we meet every other month and we have different themes. The picture here, we had a mole tasting event, which was really fun. We did that in November just before people were about to serve mole at Thanksgiving for their family meals. We had five different chefs who came out, shared their recipes, and it was the most heartwarming thing to see them sit down with the grandmas and go over recipe information. Just really, really cool. So look at your community, who's in your community, what do they like, and how can you bring something to them? Um, let's see, let's see. I think we'll pop on to the next slide here. And on the next one, this is more details. How did we figure out how to do memory cafes? I started by saying, what is a memory cafe? Um, I visited a few local memory cafes, one north of where I live, uh, one west of where I live, and I also went on a field trip with a group just to see how they handled everything. What did it look like? We visited a nearby memory farm, which does adult daycare. And we, as I said earlier, rely upon library programming for discussion points. So topics that we'll do, we've talked about vacations that people have taken. We brought a big map and we mapped out all the different locations that people had been, put push pins in and discovered all the places we had seen, uh, shared family photos from that. We had the local poet come in. We also had a local florist who came in. We, as a memory cafe, do not pay for people to come in, but some memory cafes do have funding and they find ways to uh, raise money and bring in uh, official performers, that kind of thing. But you can also ask your nephew who plays clarinet. <laughs> um, we always open with an icebreaker to help unite the participants. We find that that's really, really important. The icebreaker is something a little silly. As people arrive, my partner, who you'll hear from next, um, Angela, will make sure that everyone gets whatever we need for that activity. In one, we had little paper ice cream cones. The first family that arrived got a cone, and it would say strawberry. The next family that arrived got the ice cream, which is just paper, and it's pink. So people are kind of mixing and finding places to sit. And then as we sit down, we're asking them, before you take a seat, because we don't want to rearrange people once they're already settled, see if you can find a family that has the ice cream flavor that matches your cone. So then they would sit together, and their job was to find one thing they had in common. I thought they would find out, oh, we both have dogs. But that wasn't the case. They were so hungry to interact with someone, because it's so isolating to have dementia. Um, that they just wanted to go on and on. I was listening in and the family was saying, oh, let's see, you have four grandchildren, we have six, we better keep going. What else? You know, they wanted to learn about each other. Oh, we both have first responders in our families. And then we would go around the large group and share that one thing that they have in common. The reason for this is because now they have a friend. Next time they come, they're gonna look for, oh, that, where's that family that has the first responder? They're not coming alone anymore. So that's the reason for that icebreaker. Um, let's see, we had uh, t different topics of conversation that are designed around the interests of the participants. Once you have your core group, you can really find out, let them take the reins and let you know what they're interested in. We can pop onto the next screen. So we were reaching our audiences, both inside the senior and developmental care communities, um, but what about those caregivers that are living at home. It was very hard to find them. I saw a question pop up and we'll address things at the end here. Um, different things that we did to get the word out and we're still fighting this. We're still really working on getting the word out. Again, in the same places you would look for your volunteers, disseminating that information that we're having these memory cafes and can go out through 
church groups, synagogues, um, mosques. It can go out through the local radio station. Also, our um, police liaison is pictured here in the photo. We have our mayor in the center. I'm standing behind him and then just off to my right. The blonde right next to the mayor is our Sherry Ashenbrenner from the Elgin Police Department. She maintains a list of over a thousand senior families in our community. She has a radio program called Be Wary with Sherry, and she talks about local scams that are being tried upon our local seniors as she learns of them. But she also sends out information that can be helpful about what's happening at the library, for example. So if you find those people that can help get the word out, it just spreads and spreads. It takes time, but it will get there. Uh, let's see, let's hop on to the next screen. And so some training that helped us um, become Dementia Friendly Elgin. You can pop onto Dementia Friendly America website and they have very specific steps that you follow in order to become a dementia friendly city. Um, they're wide open and loose in the way that you do it so that you can tailor it to your community, but you do have to follow a specific set of steps. For us, because we already had our fingers in a lot of the community, it didn't take as long, but I think it typically takes a year or more um, for people to do this. So it's something that it takes a while. Um, you can call upon your community partners to share in these responsibilities once you've already developed them. And you can always include community members who are living with dementia along with their care partners. They need to have a say in what a dementia-friendly community looks like. Dementia Friendly America offers dementia training materials designed to be modified to fit the needs of your community. And if we can pop to the next slide. Because we were part of a Dementia Friendly Elgin, we then got to become part of something even bigger, the Chicago Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus. They invited all of the dementia friendly communities to come and present and I'm so proud of this picture because Angela and I ended up in it. Um, it's on their website. <laughs> and uh, so we got to come and share what we were doing with the other communities. We were the only library that took the lead on becoming dementia friendly in our whole region. Other communities started from different people that stepped forward in the community and said, this needs to happen. But the main thing is, you know, the world is run by those who show up. And so <laughs> here we are really working to make a difference. So now what we've done is we're able to have some power in numbers there. We're working with legislators to talk about the conditions of what's happening within care communities. And of course, that's really come to light as of late. Um, but these are great ways to get together and share ideas back and forth. If we can pop to the next slide. This is the last one that I have, and I really, 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 really hope that after this program, you'll pop onto www.dementiafriendsusa.org. It will take you maybe 15 to 20 minutes, and you'll become a dementia friend if you aren't already. This is probably something that I know it's getting out there, so you may already know about it, but I still wanted to share. You'll watch some videos about different sectors of your community. You only have to watch one. I chose to watch the library example, and it shows real life examples of someone who is in early stages of dementia, and they're just starting to become, sli become slightly confused. We as a society have taught ourselves to take a step back and stay out of people's business, but with the way dementia is growing and the needs that people are having, we now just need to be able to step forward, and these videos give you some comfort and confidence in how to do that. They'll show a guy who's getting on the bus and he can't figure out the right change. How do you help somebody in that moment? So this is very worth your time. I hope that you will go ahead and do that. Uh, let's see, what else do we have? I think next, my job is to introduce my coworker. Angela Boak is our South Elgin branch manager, and she's also my Memory Cafe co-moderator. So thanks so much for listening and welcome, Angela. Hello. Hello, everyone. Um, from sunny Elgin. We're actually experiencing some sunshine, and I know that that is a huge mood um, booster for me and my family. Um, as they've all mentioned, we are all kind of going through this collectively together. And I, um, I actually live next door to my parents, which has been a blessing. Um, to be able to be close and checking on them during this quarantine. And I also have six children at home that all live with me, 
we're at all different stages of learning online. I have one college graduate, um, some that are looking forward to returning to work. So that'll be wonderful for all of us. <laughs> but um, thank you, Glenna, for uh, the introduction. And I wanted to kind of pick up where she left off. I too am trained um, with a dementia uh, care pr practitioner. Um, and my passion for older people started way back in high school. Um, and I remember I started something with our student government to adopt a grandparent. And I um, partnered with a local nursing home. And then as students kind of signed up for this, I matched them with different uh, residents at the local uh, nursing home. So this passion has kind of continued my whole life. Uh, I studied gerontology uh, even as an undergrad and I realized that uh, my grandmother was suffering uh, from Alzheimer's disease in my very early 20s and I watched her decline and I immediately signed up for uh, some training through Alzheimer's um, Association which anyone can do. Uh, I was also trained to be a respite aide in the home and that's like a volunteer uh, thing you can do. You can just help your neighbors in your community. So just you can look into that. Every state has an Alzheimer's Association um, chapter. And I'm going to continue with the dementia friends that Glenna was talking about. Um, there are also, there's another step and it's called a dementia champion. And what you do is you train other people to be dementia friends. Um, and Susan Frick has been a wonderful partner for us. She works with Rush Hospital and she works in their Alzheimer's um, in the dementia training. She's a social worker there. And she will do these trainings monthly. As you can see, uh, there was one last month on April 24th for anyone to go through this dementia champion training. It only takes an hour and a half, but it's something you can do if you reach out to uh, Rush Hospital in Chicago. So uh, these are all done online, which makes it really nice for anyone anywhere. Uh, I know a lot of you are signed in from the West Coast, the East Coast. Um, I wanted to mention that Rush Hospital is actually the, they're kind of the keeper of uh, dementia friendly communities in the state of Illinois. So they're a great resource to us, their doctors, uh, everyone there has been great in training us. Another partner that we uh, have, you can go to the next slide, Billy, has been um, through our local agency on aging, which all states and communities have. Um, they trained us um, in different ways with uh, stress busters that I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Um, they've had opportunities and grants to help us with our memory cafe. Um, but the, another partner that we have that also Glenna mentioned, our police liaison to seniors, invited us to be part of the Elgin Township Triad Group. And this is a huge group. Um, the Triad is a national organization, um, and it's usually the sheriff's department. So as Danielle had mentioned earlier, you can look outside of your smaller communities um, to a larger like county sheriff, see if they have a Triad group. And what this is, is it's, it's three parts of the community. It's your first responders. So our police, our fire are very involved. It's the support groups, the protective agencies, your senior service groups. Um, even some of the private nursing homes, care facilities, memory um, facilities are part of these. And then the third part are the seniors themselves. And these seniors are usually very active in their community. They're volunteers in different places. Um, and we meet every month um, as part of the dementia friendly uh, group. They invited Glenna and I to be on this. And um, so it's just interesting. I saw that question. How do you get invited to be on these boards? How do you get involved? It's just little things and little steps you take. Um, if you volunteer, you offer your services, they see your passion in these areas and they'll invite you to be part of their groups as well. Um, next slide. Is about the stress busters I mentioned. And I believe we have three um, Three of our Hispanic services team were trained in this, as well as Glenna and I and uh, Sarah, another friend that does outreach and home delivery to our seniors in our community. Um, you can go ahead and switch slides. And what it is, is um, it's a nine week course and it's for the caregivers of people with dementia. And then there's also an, another um, program that's for chronic disease. 
Um, each of them are nine weeks, and this is to give support to caregivers in your community. It's an evidence-based program, um, and it's proven to reduce anxiety, stress, and depression. It's also teaching uh, stress management techniques. Uh, it provides relaxation and coping strategies. And each week, there's a different topic. There's a really nice book for all the participants. Um, and at the end of each session, we go over uh, different anxiety reducing technique. One is just breathing, one is um, music therapy, one is aromatherapy. So it's something that they're supposed to kind of try and introduce them to something maybe they haven't thought about doing because they're caught up in caregiving and they're exhausted. Um, and it's just something for them to do for themselves. And then uh, at the end of the nine weeks, they're supposed to kind of make a commitment to do something for themselves at that same time that they've been meeting. And what's wonderful since the quarantine is that they have changed this to an online program that we're now going to be able to offer um, in June. Lana and I are going to partner and start a new nine weeks um, for the caregivers. Obviously, there's going to be some hoops to jump through um, with technology and seeing if they can all uh, use Zoom and uh, do some maybe tutorials on the side beforehand so that they can all get online and they can all share um, and be a part of this great uh, program. Can you flip for us, Billy? The next topic I want to touch on, and I'm going to kind of skim over because I know we're running out of time here, is just how much outreach we've done uh, for our customers that are experiencing homelessness or are houseless, as Danielle said. We have done an all-staff training day with Ryan Dowd, and I saw in the chat that a lot of you have had contact uh, with him or either know about his book that he wrote for ALA. Um, he has a phenomenal uh, podcast. He's been counting all the days of quarantine that he has uh, really dove into there at Hesed House day by day. Uh, he hasn't been able to go home, and he's really quarantined with everyone there. He's a phenomenal speaker, and he really did a great training for our staff um, just on working with our customers that are experiencing homelessness, really showing them respect like you would any other customer, um, being fair, not having rules about, you know, they can't have their items with them, but the, the neighbor can have their laptop. Um, so it's just been uh, really great for all of our staff. Every, every department attended from maintenance and security um, to our marketing department, everyone got to benefit from his training, which was fabulous. Uh, we have also had presentations um, from our PADS group, our local PADS group, spoke to our outreach division, just what the local needs were for our community. And that's how you get to be a part of these boards and asked to be um, a part of the community when they're looking for replacements and things like that on their um, director boards is you invite them in, you show them that you're interested in serving the population they're serving, how can we be a part of it? Um, the other one I was gonna mention was the Niche, Niche Academy. They have a really great homeless um, issues video training and that's at my.nicheacademy.com and I believe Ryan Dowd was a part of um, also uh, creating that video, which is really great. It's free, anybody can be a part of that. You don't have to pay to have a speaker come in or anything. Uh, next slide. And then this is our new web page that we've just put up. Um, Melissa Bernasek, our information services director, pulled this together since the quarantine. And it's just our regular website, gailborn.info forward slash with food. And this is going to be all kinds of resources, uh, food pantries, even restaurants that are offering like kids eat free on certain days, things like that. Uh, for people that are experiencing food scarcity, just really being sensitive to our community at this time. and. Um, there's also some information from the school district, one of our major partners on free lunches and how they're still passing out um, food, food for our um, students in our community. Um, next slide. And then I want to just talk about resiliency a little bit with our preschoolers. And I have this passion for my seniors in my community but I'm also very attached to my preschool story times and my little uh, visitors to our South Elgin branch here. Here I am doing a story time and it was a superhero based story time. And we had these huge stuffed animals wearing masks and capes and they got to hug on and love on. And then we had capes and masks for them as well. They made a little craft. 
Um, but one of the things that we do through our story time, both our Hispanic story times and our English uh, story times are to make, it's a place to make connections. And these little people are getting some of their first socialization lessons and we're nurturing their positive self images. We're encouraging them. Um, we're reinforcing self care, which is going to include downtime and reading together and um, just relaxing and enjoying their, their time at the library. Uh, we're also having them move forward towards their goals, like completing their summer reading program and having them check in and showing you what they loved to read and encouraging that, um, that, that interaction between someone outside their family, a librarian or, or staff member at the branch, and um, you know, just the, these young people that are growing and, and seeing encouragement from their community members aside from their teachers. Uh, also, we're looking for opportunities for self-discovery and how to help others. So whenever there's um, something happening in our community or Glenna will tell me, oh, we're gonna you know, deliver some cards, We'll have little activities that the preschoolers can participate in. They made little veterans appreciation cards during for before Veterans Day. Um, they've made little spring cards and, and little crafts that they can donate to uh, decorate some of their local community um, memory cafes or memory uh, facilities. So there's a couple tabs there uh, for healthychildren.org and zero to three. There was another really great uh, resource that CNN did a town hall with the Sesame Street characters, and they had children asking questions um, about COVID-19 and just really great resource for parents. Um, but my children watched it along with me, so it's, it's great for all ages. Go ahead, Billy. Um, another thing that we do to invite our community in um, is we just use one of our resources that we have online for any, any of our patrons to use, and we're, we use Canopy, um, but we have a No Shushing Movie Friday, and this was really designed for families with young children that might get a little bit loud or seniors that really need it turned up a little bit. It's okay if they're whispering loudly to their neighbors, and uh, Glenna has been great in inviting in her senior communities. We have busloads of seniors that come with their walkers and wheelchairs. Um, we've had special ed classes come in. It's been wonderful. We offer something different every Friday. We don't offer just children's movies. We'll have biographies. Um, you can see there, there's PBS specials. There's um, foreign films, travel things. Um, they've been training videos. And on Canopy too, if you have that for your library, if that's one of your uh, digital resources that you subscribe to, know that there are many uh, library trainings on there for library staff and information services. The other thing that we've used that for is uh, having like a four week series. And um, the director of branch services offered a four week series on raising emotionally and socially healthy kids. Um, it's a great resource on there on Canopy and she highlighted, uh, I think it's 12 weeks, but she highlighted the four weeks in developing your children's emotional intelligence, uh, teaching kids to care, anxiety, and growing up social in a digital age. So those are all things that parents can go back and look at. All you do is type in your library card and you'll have access to all those videos. Go ahead, Billy. And I think I'm going to hand this off to Danielle. I hope I didn't rush through it too much. Just touching on a couple more things that everybody can kind of get involved with. Danielle? Thank you very much, Angela and Glenna and Billy. Uh, again, Bobby, uh, I just want to go through a few things. I want to make sure that there's time for Bobby and for questions. Uh, you can build resilient communities. You can do it with your community. You can be at the table or you can lead the efforts. So uh, look around and, and take a look at what you are already doing. I believe that's important uh, as you're assessing your community. Assess what you do have yourself. What do you have to offer um, to the community when you're sitting at a table? And are we experiencing some maybe deep listening that we can be doing? So uh, also maybe training on some listening skills and how to um, uh, really just engage community and, and uh, assess and listen to them. Next slide, please. Again, uh, asset-based asset community development, you can find that uh, online. Um, 
Miriam Lytle, our division chief, is a strong proponent of this, and uh, our executive director, uh, Carol Metal, uh, and our board, uh, all working together to look at what our community has to offer and what we have to offer it. Um, so that is an important piece. Next slide. And then what's your return on investment? So if you're looking at how libraries can justify these expenses and staff time, think about the value returned back to you. So uh, in our resources, there's independent sector, there's um, I love libraries calculator, there's what the training is worth, um, how can you uh, justify financially what's the return back to the community? Next slide, please. And we are all fueled by the power of community. You know, we're coming up on Trauma-Informed Care Awareness Day. That's uh, on the 15th. Uh, so as a community, we will you know, celebrate that. And um, also, as we're going through this, as a, as a library community, uh, take some time for staff care. Our, our HR director, Eva, shares out wellness tips. We do some... Um, mindfulness techniques, and we share each other's uh, self-care um, items when we're meeting as a department, uh, and take care of yourself. So thank you for your kind attention. The um, information and the training is well worth it. It informs our programming, and it actually sometimes drives it. So when we know more, we can serve all of our community at whatever level uh, of engagement that they are. Um, you can always just assume somebody has ACEs. Um, you probably yourself have ACEs. Uh, so we can understand that and work from there. And uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. I think thank we'll turn you, now. Yeah. Um, so uh, the question I see right now, and we've got about nine minutes. Um, how much virtual programming are you doing um, right now during the COVID crisis? Um, for that, um, okay. for the seniors, we're doing about one video per week. It's taking a little bit of time. To, I had to try seven different types of um, software before I found what I really wanted to use. Um, purchased that and then was able to move forward. So um, just for the senior department, we're doing about one video per week, but then I think Billy has more to share. Um, on Facebook, every Monday through Friday at 11, we're doing child story times. At two, we're doing a bilingual program, including a bilingual story time or another bilingual event. And then at seven, we're doing a program for adults or teens, including craft programs I taught People had to sew masks in 12 minutes, and last night I made dog biscuits um, with three ingredients. So we are doing a variety of programming. And now we're going to be dipping in in May into going back to more structured programming online. Last week we had a college program through Zoom with our local private school that had 48 in attendance, and we're going to be dipping back with uh, our bilingual conversation groups, book clubs, and other programs online. Yeah, I can speak for the um, programming group that's uh, doing grade school age things. Uh, they're going to try some online Zoom programs, but most of the story times have been on Facebook Live or pre-recorded, and then they're using Facebook. Um, they're also storing our videos on our YouTube channel. Uh, so that's been really helpful for people that don't catch it live. Then they can always go back and, and watch them. And for me, uh, we, I do very large festivals. So um, Asian Pacific Heritage Celebration, this is our fifth year. Uh, we are doing virtual programming, Facebook Live, and a web page with all of our community partners and presenters coming uh, in virtually to do dance instruction and, and uh, those types of things. And right now, uh, skipping that particular event is not a good idea. We really want to support, celebrate, and uplift our Asian Pacific Islander uh, community right now. So um, again, with that lens of partnership and, you know, what are the needs and the social emotional needs of your community, um, 
you know, what, what are the things that you can do and how can you deliver them virtually? Great, thank you. Um, I also saw somebody asking what um, video software you're using. I think like, are you using Zoom? How, how are you hosting those? I think there's gonna be a combination. Um, so for uh, any of the registration kinds of children's programs, those will be on Zoom and then they'll be able to send out an invite to everyone. Um, but there will be also things on YouTube where they know that the children can just kind of happen in, drop in and see the videos. So like more of a passive programming, they don't, they can do it whenever they want. So we have Facebook live, we have a YouTube channel. Uh, so we can develop programming, uh, go directly to the YouTube channel and share that out to our specific organizations. We did a mindfulness program through a presenter through Activate Elgin, paid for him uh, to do mindfulness and movement um, because kids are stressed and parents are stressed. And so uh, we were able to share that out with all of our alignment and U46 and Juvenile Justice Council and all of our health organizations, uh, direct them to the Facebook page and to our uh, YouTube channel for those. And um, Katie does some wonderful uh, mindfulness and movement um, programming as well. We're also sending multi-generational videos out to a website which is uh, memorycafedirectory.com and from there these 10-minute videos are going to be able to be used by any virtual memory cafe moderators anywhere. Um, they can play them for like 10 minutes, have a discussion topic, and then get into the topic after they watch those videos together. So we're producing those on a weekly basis also. And then I see one question, a follow-up. What software are you using for your Canopy movies? Okay, so Canopy is its own subscription. They have the videos already on that platform. Um, all they have to do is enter their library card number, and they can download, I believe it's five movies or videos uh, per month. So I think maybe the question is what, you know, what is it live right now? Um, I think... I think the answer is, you know, we can't stream it live no, we can't. Uh, from the platform, but people, what we have done with um, like our Earth Month group who wanted to still do the 50, uh, 50 events for the 50th anniversary this year, uh, we curated some films on Canopy and Hoopla and uh, they sent out the links to um, not only get a library card, but view the film. And then uh, together as a community, they can have a discussion on whatever platform, Facebook, later. So they can agree on a time to view the film as a community on their own, and then they have the discussion. Okay, we're um, right about, oh, sorry. So I think, oh, um, so I've seen a lot of people want the slides. So. Um, just for attendees, like the software system that we use for registration doesn't let me do attachments. So um, we will figure something out. <laughs> How about that? Um, you're going to get an email from me within the next week that's a follow-up to this, um, as well as the recording. And I'm going to check and see what I can do to put them somewhere maybe so that they're accessible. Um, I'll have to check with our web, web services people and stuff. Um, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and do the wrap up for the webinar. <clears throat> if you enjoyed this program, you might be interested in the one we're having in two weeks about virtual programs for preschoolers. I'm encouraging wellness, movement, and creativity. You'll receive the sign up link for that in the email I send you. <clears throat> Oops, there we go. Just want to remind everybody that the CDC is your best source for information on COVID-19. Um, I particularly like to point out this section, I think, that gets overlooked or just doesn't get maybe as much attention, but I think is particularly helpful. There is this, a place on the CDC about daily life and coping during COVID-19. And as our speakers talked about, self-care and, and our own physical and mental well-being is very important. Um, I also like that they have a section about animals, which is kind of nice since I'm home with my dog. The kids thing is there too. Um, what next? If you're not a member of the National Network of Libraries of Medicine, please consider joining. The name is a mistake, or not a mistake, but um, it's for everyone, not just medical libraries, and our friends at Yale Borden are members. A membership is free and it's institutional. 
You can see other upcoming free classes and webinars from us at nlm.gov training. If you are interested in continuing education credit, <clears throat> within the next week or so, you will receive, it, receive at least one email from me, probably two, that will have a link to the recording, a survey on, and feedback about this webinar, and then the instructions for claiming the 1.5 um, CE credits for today. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the National Network of Libraries of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel. Select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.